I struggled a little bit with the uh, title of this series of messages. And finally, came up with uh, one that I think captures what I'm trying to accomplish here. It's called The Christian Mindset in a Culture of Chaos. I think people today have lots of questions on their minds and they're, they're trying to figure out how to, to, to even think about this world and think about what's going on in our country. We certainly have a lot of chaotic things going on and we need to address those as Christians in the most, most thoughtful way possible. Now I wanna encourage you to view all of these messages. I'm not going to be able to lay out a case in one message. It's going to take a series of messages, and I hope you will come back week after week in order to get the, the whole picture of what I believe is the Christian mindset. You know, the Christian mindset is a response that, re, uh, that, is, that we make to this world based on our understanding of things. If we don't properly understand things, we will not make the proper response to this world. The mindset is a worldview. is it's God's narrative. It's, it's his story, and it's where do we fit into that story. I am uh, been a student of God's word all of my life, and I believe that there are some things that are not part of the conversation that we are having in this country. And as a result, I, be really, I believe that the solutions that we come to are not necessarily solving the root issues. They're dealing with symptoms and not the real cause. And so today I'm going to begin my first message that's entitled Eden. And I'd like to read what I wrote about that and you'll have this available to you. Eden. Just the word sounds peaceful and perfect. Man's first home was prepared by God in the same way our second home is being prepared by Jesus right now in John 14 and verse 1. Trees full of pleasing food, a river watering the garden, and meaningful work to do. God himself walked through Eden in the cool of the day. And then there was that one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, forbidden, yet very enticing. And the first couple, they ate of that tree and everything changed. The nakedness was expo exposed. There were snakes that were cursed. There was pain in childbearing. There was the realignment of the relationship between male and female. There was painful toil and thorns and thistles and sweat. And since that time, man has tried to recreate Eden. Many proposals have been made and we've named this ideal place with many names. There's Nirvana, Shangri-La, Utopia. We put on soft meditative music. We have waterfalls and inspirational bonsais and maybe indirect lighting, all in an attempt to create an atmosphere of Eden. Tranquility was disrupted by human decision to disobey God, gaining man a sense of good and evil, and with it a sense of fairness and justice. Politics and economics have joined religion in getting in on the act of restoring Eden. Marxism is a good example. This ideology has a noble aspiration, the equality of all mankind, no class warfare. All is cooperation and sharing and oneness for those who can embrace the idea. Yet, that nasty little enemy shows up 
to throw sand in the gears and it becomes clear if we're ever going to reach Eden through Marx, then some folks simply have to die. Lots of them. Millions of them. The Nazis tried another idea to recreate Edom, but only for certain people. Not everyone was allowed in. Muhammad sought it through Islam, but again, failure because some just simply won't pray towards Mecca seven times a day. Some thought Eden could be created for some by subjecting others to slavery. Some sought Eden in political parties, promising the happy times will be here again and a chicken in every pot and an Oldsmobile in every garage. The UN tried. Communism, socialism, the monarchy, colonialism, one world government. All of these set forth an ideal of the brotherhood of man through different systems. They all have one thing in common. In order to maintain that system, there has to be some degree of force. The USA had a good idea too. A constitution, a bill of rights, a declaration of independence based upon God's decree that all men are created equal and they have a right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. As much as I love this country, and I believe that what we aspire to are good ideas and we need to be supported by every American. We are not promised success. Our experiment can go wrong too. And ultimately, all of these systems of man are subject to failure. Why? Because none of them address the reason why man lost Eden in the first place. Well, let's unpack this a little bit. Three ideas today that I'd like to get across. One is, is that God created Eden. Secondly, Eden was lost by man. And thirdly, all the attempts to recreate Eden by man without addressing the fundamental issues of why we lost it in the first place are doomed to failure. First of all, let's look at this idea that Eden was created by God. According to his nature, everything God does is in accordance with his nature including that first garden that he created, including that universe that he created, everything corresponds to the nature of God, the perfect nature of God. And therefore, when he creates something, he's going to create it in an idealistic way because it's based on his perfect nature. A good illustration of this is found on something that I find we don't talk about maybe enough, but I want to read an extended passage to you that captures, I think, this idea of the nature of God as it applies to the creation of Eden as well as the rest of the world. It's found in Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs 8, and we'll start with verse 22 and go down to verse 36. The wise man said, The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works. He's talking about wisdom here. When it said he brought me forth, he's talking about wisdom before his deeds of old. And so what existed before anything was created? It was the wisdom of God. It was appointed from eternity, from the beginning, before the world began. And when there were no oceans, I was given birth. When there was no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills, I was given birth. Before he made the earth or his fields, or any of the dust of the world. I was there when he set the heavens in place, when he marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, and when he established the clouds above, and he fixed securely the fount fountains of the deep, and when he gave the sea its boundary so the waters would not overstep his command. 
and when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Then I was the craftsman at his side. I was filled with delight day after day, rejoicing in the whole world and delighting in mankind. Listen to my instruction and be wise and do not ignore it. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my doors, waiting at my doorway. For whoever finds me finds life and receives favor from the Lord. But whoever fails to find me harms himself. All who hate me love death. Wow. I hope you will give careful consideration to those words because it describes the fulcrum between wisdom and chaos, life and death. If we're going to understand the nature of Eden that we are all searching for, this place of perfect justice, this place of perfect fairness, this place where everyone loves one another and we, we can all get along and everything is beautiful, we're going to have to consider how Eden was built in the first place. It was constructed because of the wisdom of God. One of the things that caused us to lose Eden is because man was not wise. Or perhaps we could say he was kind of wise in his own eyes. He had his own wisdom, but not a wisdom that was from above. Why did man lose Eden? Because he thought he was smarter and wiser than God. Eden was created by the wisdom of God. But Eden was also lost because of man's decision. If we go back to Genesis chapter 3, again, I hope you have your Bibles and that you're following along with this. But in Genesis chapter 3, verses 20. 3 and 24 it so it says so the lord god banished him talking about adam from the garden of eden to work the ground from which he had been taken and after he drove the man out he placed on the east side of the garden of eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life god separated man from eden because of man's sin it was lost because of man. And he was banished from that tree of life that was in the middle of the garden. He chose death over life because God had said, in the day you eat of this tree, you will surely die. And so God separated him from the tree of life. But we, we have to understand that that God was simply giving them the consequences of their own decision. And he made it clear that he did not want them going back into Eden. And he also made it clear by implication that if they were ever going to regain Eden, it was going to be because of something God had to do. Now, in the New Testament, we see the other side of the story through the eyes of the Christian scripture. So in Romans chapter 5, beginning at verse 12 through 14, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all sinned. For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, who was a pattern of the one to come. And then down in verse 18, it says, Consequently, just as the result of one tras trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of the one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. We certainly will return to that 
theme and that thought later on, but I wanted to introduce it in the very first one to show you where this is all going. Because if we're going to regain Eden, if we're going to regain that perfect environment where everyone can live in peace and harmony, harmony and we can experience fairness and justice for all, then it's going to be through something that God does. Man is good at losing things. He's not good at finding, finding them. He's not very good at recreating them. You know, I'm pretty good at demolition. I'm not very good at rebuilding. And certainly if you left Eden up to me, I, you would have a very poor place to live because I don't know how to create Eden. But God knows how to create Eden for us. But it has to be on his terms. And then there's this idea of the attempt, the attempt to recreate this Eden and how man goes about doing that. Um, man does it, I believe, by mostly treating symptoms instead of getting down to the actual disease that created a loss of Eden in the first place. Sometimes man just simply is creating expressions of the problem, not the problem itself. There has to begin with an awareness. There's an awareness in Eden when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there was an awareness of good and evil. But with that awareness, comes judgment and with judgment comes the understanding of injustice you see good and evil is all about right and wrong it's about just and unjust it's about the the way we perceive the world and i can tell you at the core of the chaos that we're experiencing right now in this world it's all about fairness it's about justice that people are claiming that some things are right, some things are wrong, and, and we need to find ways to right the wrongs. And so this awareness, when we, when we eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it creates this awareness that there is a right and wrong. And as soon as we have that awareness, we're immediately going into a case of judgment. We begin to make judgments between what is right and what is wrong. And depending on how we view it, and many times we view it through our hurts and through the problems that we experience in our lives or through things that happen to us. We view it through our eyes many times. Then we begin to define what is an injustice. What is injustice? And so for Adam and Eve, as soon as their eyes were opened and God came to them and he confronted them with their sin, do you notice what they did immediately? It was, an, it was just a natural response. You remember that the blame game started. Adam blamed the woman. Actually, he may have even blamed God because he says, God, it was this woman that you gave me. In other words, uh, you did this to me, God. You're the one who created this injustice. You're the one who created this or this woman, at least, because, you know, she saw the fruit and she offered it to me and I ate it. What did the woman do when she was confronted with her sin? She blamed the serpent. And she said, well, God, I was just minding my own business. And I was just going along here, you know, just happy to live in the garden. Everything was great. And then the snake come along and he began to talk to me and he began to fill my mind with all of these ideas about about how wonderful it would be to be as wise as you are. And so I ate. It's the snake's fault. You see what we tend to do? It's, it's so easy for us to fall into this approach of setting up good guys and bad guys. The ones who are to blame, the ones who are not to blame. And usually... From my perspective, I'm not the one to blame. It's always someone else. 
Why am I not happy? Why don't I live in Eden? Why am I not content? Why am I not just waking up joyful every morning and singing zippity doo doo da and and you know and skipping through life with bluebirds on my shoulder and it's because somebody else is messing it up for me. It's because we got other people out there that won't let me live in peace. It's their problem. And it's not too far of a leap to say, if I want to be happy, I've got to get rid of those people. I've got to either marginalize them, I've got to put them where they have no influence or where they can't touch me. Or we begin to say, I got to get rid of them. And again, going back to Marx, which ended up being the experiment in Russia and the revolution that occurred in Russia, it started out again with a noble idea, the equality of man, no working class, the workers, you know, share in the profits with the with everybody else and everybody equal work and equal pay and all these things. Great noble idea. But what they found was is that there were people who didn't go along with the idea because again, they had a vested interest in keeping the system the way it is. Because the system is a system of uh, making profit and gaining some benefit from what you do and sharing it with other people was just not their idea of equality. And so what happened? The revolution ended up being a bloody revolution that caused millions of people to be exterminated because it's their problem, it's what they are doing. If they would just simply cooperate, if they would simply live the way they're supposed to, if they would be what they're supposed to be, then I, my life would be wonderful. It's the blame game. Don't you see, we're doing exactly what Adam and Eve did when they were confronted with the issue of why did they lose Eden? They lost Eden because they made a decision to sin to disobey God and not to listen to him. And so we're all trying to get back to the garden. You know, I'd like to remind you that at the very end of the book, in the book of Revelation, listen to this description. In chapter 22 of Revelation, and then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as a crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him, and they will see His face, and his name will be on their foreheads and there will be no more night and they will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. Isn't that a wonderful description of what we all long for? Getting back to the garden, back to the tree of life, back to that place where it all began so that we can all enjoy living in Eden but when we turn on our news every night or every day or whatever, or you look at your news feed on, on uh, Facebook or wherever you get your news, you don't see, you don't see any real solutions to how do we get back to Eden? What you normally see is just simply a description of the chaos. It gets described over and over and over again. And what happens? How, do, how does man approach it? One group blames another. It's always somebody else's fault. Why we don't have a perfect place to live. Well, I really want you to think about this because this is one of the first 
if you will, stones in the foundation of our mindset. So we have to go back and look at this through the eyes of God, how he originally created this world to be for us and how it got messed up. And I'm telling you, a study of history shows one thing after another of people trying to recover Eden and doing it in ways that just simply create more and more problems. So we're going to try to be a part of the solution. And by the only way we can do that is to have a Christian mindset. So God bless you. I hope this has been helpful to you as we begin this journey together. God bless. Thank you.